Well, hello, Pine Grove Church family and maybe others that uh, may be watching in for our Sunday school lesson. This is for Sunday morning, uh, August the 2nd. And this is actually uh, late Thursday afternoon that we're taping this. Uh, so uh, I guess Larry can run this at, at 9 or maybe later in the day, whatever works best for the church schedule. And uh, this... Uh, Today's lesson is titled, uh, We Pray for One Another, and this on page 89 of uh, the Les Student Manual that has the NIV translation. I don't know the uh, page number for the uh, King James. I don't have a copy of, uh, of that student manual. And this picks up uh, in Ephesians, and this is actually the second prayer that Paul has in the book of Ephesians. Now, last week, Bobby used a word that I thought was dead on when you look at the book of Ephesians, and that is profound. And there are some really profound spiritual truths in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, the first 14 verses, uh, Paul goes through those uh, several uh, points of theology there of where we stand as believers in Christ and what our election and his choosing of us to be his children exactly what that means and then uh, in, at the end of chapter 1 and in chapter 2 that Bobby covered last week we just have an amazing thing the, the church is formed and what's so amazing about that is we have now Jew and Gentile that are equal. That is the great mystery of the church. Uh, the animosity that has always existed uh, between Jew and Gentile, and you see it in the, in the day of Jesus. I mean, his encounter with the Samaritan woman uh, at the well. I mean, Jews didn't even travel through Samaria. So there was, there was the hatred there. And that just reflected the general Jewish attitude of superiority, especially in matters of religion or spirituality. And for those two groups to be joined together, as uh, Ephesians 2, I think it's maybe verse 13 or 14 says, to one new man. It's just amazing. Amazing. Uh, and then we get into Paul's prayer. Uh, now, let me say up front before we get into the lesson, uh, the prayer that Paul prays is on a deeply spiritual level. I do not think that takes away from our praying for physical things, for our safety, for health, uh, for security, for financial matters, matters that might cause us anxiety, our insecurities that we have, that does not take away from that. This is just another aspect. Uh, I, know, I, I know many of you have, uh, have a prayer journal. Uh, I have a prayer journal. I jot down names of people uh, that I pray for, specific needs or whatever. And, uh, and then when you look at uh, prayer like we're going to look at in Ephesians 3, 14, beginning in verse 14, you begin to think, how can I really pray effectively for this person? <clears throat> how can we pray for each other as a church body to be effective, to grow spiritually, to glorify Christ? That's the end result, that we would glorify Christ, that we would be mature in Christ and reflect His glory uh, within the body and then outside the body, as we're in the community, as we're sharing Christ, as we're in the marketplace, at work, whatever we're doing, how can we reflect Christ in a, in a, in a spiritual kind of way? And this prayer kind of addresses that. And it is just beyond words. I have to agree with what David said in Psalm 139, verse 9, when he considers the first eight and nine verses of Psalm 139, about all that, knew, all that God knew about him and how intimate God was involved with his life, David's reply, his response to that was, 
I can't attain to that. It's too high for me. I can't, I can't grasp that. I can't understand that. Well, I'm in that same boat as I look through uh, this prayer. I have to say that I, I can't quite grasp that. And quite frankly, that's not really the way I pray. I pray that way some, but not. I don't pray that way like I want to. I don't quite know how to get there. But in verse 20 in chapter 3, there's hope. There's hope for us. There is hope for us. Because God is working in ways beyond anything we could ever think or imagine. So we'll get into that. Uh, let me start uh, in verse 14. Let me put this over here out the way. In verse 14, uh, now in the Greek, as I understand it, verse 14 through 21, which is the essence of the prayer, is all one sentence. Now, Molly, I don't know how you, how you feel about that. Back in the day, we used to uh, diagram sentences. I wouldn't even know where to start. A diagram in this sentence, that is just a... My English teacher in high school, Betty Spear, would tell me, Danny, that is a run-on sentence. You need to do something about that. She'd have red all over everywhere on it. Uh, that's, a, that's just a run-on sentence. But this is just one sentence, just kind of like one prayer. And what's interesting here is, in verse 14, he says, For this reason, well... If we go back to the first verse of chapter 3, he says, for this reason. Now, Paul has just explained, as Bobby covered some last week, about this new church, this new man, this Jew-Gentile that are now co-heirs, that are equals. The mystery of that, the magnificence of that, God's plan. And Paul is, is going to be praying about that. Well, he starts in verse 1, he says, for this reason... But then he gets sidetracked and he leads up into a, at the end of verse 8 just an, another just profound, deep statement. When he says, well, verse 8, he says, To me, talking about himself, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ unfathomable. And we're going to see that in, in this prayer. That it transcends human intellect. It transcends human knowledge. It transcends human logic. Human endeavor. It's unfathomable. It's interesting to me, I will occasionally read uh, uh, an article by someone and he may have many degrees who is obviously not a believer, and they will have some complicated, detailed explanation of some theology. And it's rather humorous to me how they try to understand things from a logical, intellectual perspective only and, and without having benefit of the Holy Spirit. But we have benefit of the Holy Spirit, and that's what Paul's going to be praying about. So let's go. For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father. Now, Jewish tradition and the tradition even of the church at this time is that people did not get on their knees when they prayed generally. They stood. That was the normal posture for praying. Uh, would be standing. Now, only in times of distress or either in times of intense worship and adoration would the individual pray and be on their knees? Of course, in times of distress and despair, I think of Christ on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane and praying like sweat, like drops of blood. The intensity of that prayer, the intensity of the battle going on, of him doing the will of the Father. That spiritual battle that was going on. Now here, I think Paul is just so overwhelmed with understanding the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ's death, all these points of theology that he's been teaching about in the first chapter, and then the, then the church, and then, as, as he's already stated, 
those unfathomable riches of Christ, all that we have in Christ, all that we have in the grace that was given at the cross to us. And so I think Paul is just overwhelmed. And so he's on his knees. And it's from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives this name. It's, when God is not a Jewish God. That was the prevailing concept. That the Gentiles have multiple other gods. Polytheistic. That was the idea. But now in Christ, God is God of Jew and Gentile in the spiritual sense. He's always been God, obviously. But now it's in the spiritual sense in one body. What does Paul pray? <clears throat> well, there are three main areas that he prays about. He says in verse 16 that he, God the Father, would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened. That's the first thing. That's the first broad area that Paul is praying about. He's praying this for the church at Ephesus. And this was a circular letter. This was a, a letter, an epistle, that Paul wrote while he was in prison in Rome in maybe 62, 63 A.D., and this was uh, circulated throughout Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, so that he's praying for these individual little house churches and probably for individuals that he knew. Because Paul had an up-close kind of ministry. He knew people. He interacted with people. Uh, he had intimate contact with people. So he's praying this intimate prayer for real people, for real churches. And so it's a perfect model for us to be praying that for our church and for each other. For our missionaries, for our outreach programs, the ministries of the church, whatever. Strength. The second thing that uh, big major topic is to, in verse uh, 17, 18, and 19, is to understand and comprehend the vastness and the depth of Christ's love. And then he says that this surpasses knowledge. That's interesting that Paul is going to be praying for us to understand something. And then he says in the same prayer that it surpasses knowledge. And then finally at the end of verse 19 that once we have this, once we have this strength, this power, we have this understanding of Christ's love, that we would be filled up to all the fullness of God, our maturity in Christ. So, with those three big topics in mind, let's look a little bit and see, uh, see what we can, can, can learn here. <clears throat> Notice that the reservoir, the repository, if you will, the supply for answering this prayer is from God Himself. He would grant you that God would, would grant you, He would gift to you according to the riches of His glory. It's all on God. It's not on us. It's not on something we do. Our good works do not earn any brownie points with God. Uh, I kind of grew up thinking that, by the way. And somehow hoping that my good would outweigh my bad and that would help me get across the, the line, if you will, uh, into heaven. Well, that's not the gospel. That's not grace. That's not at all what Scripture teaches. It's all on God according to the riches of His glory. And the prayer is that we would be strengthened to have power strengthened with power <clears throat> through His Spirit in the inner man. It's God's Spirit that's going to energize the inner man, our soul, our inner being, our mind, our heart. Now, 2 Corinthians 4.16 talks about the outer man deteriorating, but that the inner man is being built up. 
Now, uh, as you age, just naturally, you'll understand, yeah, the outer man is uh, deteriorating. And I don't quite know how to react to that sometimes, to tell you the truth. Uh, that's just a fact. But my prayer is, and Paul's prayer here is, that even in the midst of that, even in the midst of pain, aches, sufferings, disappointments, maybe disillusionment, whatever, that the inner man will be built up. That the inner man will be strong. Now, I got to thinking about this idea of strengthening with power through His Spirit. Now, if you flip back uh, to chapter 1, picking up in verse 16, this is Paul's first prayer. I don't want to spend time here, uh, but I just want to mention this. Uh, Paul says in verse 16, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. The idea there is that Paul prays for them over and over and over. See, when we're burdened about something, we're concerned about something, we're concerned about somebody, prayer is not just a one and done. I ain't checked that off. I prayed for you. That's it. No. We have empathy, sympathy, concern, care for that person. So we keep praying. That's the idea behind this verse. Uh, in, in verse 17, he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that word glory again, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of Him. What Paul's talking about is that in these first 14 verses of chapter 1, all these deep doctrinal statements he's made, that we would begin to understand that. And we understand that we have wisdom through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's revealed to us. The human intellect won't understand that. It's spiritually discerned. And then he says in 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance. And in verse 19, the verse I want to get to, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe? And then He relates that power in verse 20. He says and that He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated him in the heavenlies. And then in verse 21, he gave him rule and dominion over the whole world. And then in verse 22 and 23, over his church, over his body. How much power do you think that took? Now, I just was interested in this, so I looked it up. And this is a date that... Uh, a lot of you older people will remember. It's hard for me to believe. It's 51 years ago. July the 20th, 1969. How about Neil Armstrong? Buzz Aldrin. Remember those guys? First went to walk on the moon? I looked this up and it was unbelievable to me. And I was just thinking, how much power did it take to lift that rocket ship up and with enough thrust to break the gravitational pull of the earth and put it in orbit. Listen to this. It took 4,578,000 pounds of fuel. Now that fuel uh, was just regular old kerosene and liquid oxygen is what it was. Now when all that ignited, and you can see that, as it lifted up, I mean, just huge. You wonder why it didn't burn everything up. How much energy was that transformed into? 7.5 million pounds of thrust to lift it up. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The power that's involved there and the power we're talking about here surpasses that. We serve a living and powerful God. His desire is for His Spirit 
to dwell in us and to energize us, to give us power, to strengthen us. And what's the purpose of that in the inner man in verse 17? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We have no faith apart from the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have no faith. He draws us. John 6, 44, I believe it is. That Christ draws us. The Holy Spirit draws us. We weren't really interested in knowing Christ. He drew us. We were interested in our own little world. That Christ may dwell, may live, may have residence. That He may abide. And I think this goes from point of salvation through our Christian life. Abiding dwelling in us, taking up residence in us. We're going to see at the end of verse 19 what that looks like. That's being filled up. That's being filled up to the fullness of God that we take on the character of Christ. That's being filled up. And that begins with that power of the Holy Spirit of salvation and then working in our, through our entire Christian life. And that you now he's, he's changing now to the love aspect. And that you being rooted and grounded in love, the, the, the very essence of the Christian life is loving, feeling differently about people, feeling differently about God, viewing the world differently. I mean, Jeannie and I got saved at age 26. I viewed my patients in a different way after I got saved. I viewed everybody differently. I mean, and it was it was just hard to put that into practice. And, and even today, uh, it's hard to love some people. Of course, you might say that I'm hard to love sometimes, and that would probably be true. But he says, but being rooted and grounded in love, in verse 18, his prayer now is that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, and the height, and the depth. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Now he's talking about two aspects of knowing here. The first thing he's talking about is a dimensional aspect. He's talking about the breadth. How wide is it? The length, the height, and the depth. I read this in, in a commentary. It's, it's kind of a paraphrase of what Augustine and some of the early church fathers, their explanation of this. And they said that Christ's love is wide enough to embrace the whole world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world and it motivated Him. It motivated Him to send Christ to the cross. He loved. Ephesians 2, five, But Christ, being rich in mercy, because of His great love, hath made us alive together with Christ. For by grace have you been saved. How long is it? That's a word of the length. That's a word of duration. But it's from eternity past. Because Scripture says that in eternity past, Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world. God already had provision in eternity past for our salvation. And then eternity future. Forever. 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 To have an eternal relationship with the eternal God. That's salvation. Forever. How high? How high? can reach down on earth and take a sinner to a celestial setting in heaven, to the very throne of God in the highest heaven. How deep? How deep? It's deep enough to send His Son to die on the cross for our sins. To send His Son who was in a perfect setting
perfect eternal harmony and relationship with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son into some way that's mysterious to us, He could be separated and become the God-man and come to earth, suffer as a human, and die a humiliating death and bear the weight and the wrath of God for the sin of the world. That's how deep it is. That's how deep it is. Now this word in verse 18, to comprehend, means to understand intellectually. That's the word, it's the Greek word gnosis, for knowledge. But now he changes that in verse 19. He says in verse 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints. In other words, this understanding of Christ's love, it's not just for a few of the more spiritual. It's for all believers. It's for all the members of the body that we would think about the love of Christ and what that means and how that works in our life. But then, in verse 19, he says, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. What surpasses knowledge? Experiential. To experience the love of Christ. We should reflect on who we were before Christ. Who we are in Christ. What we are now. What our inheritance will be. To be with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in perfect harmony forever. To experience that. That's Paul's prayer. That God would grant us strength through the power of His Spirit in the inner man that we would be built up so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that being rooted and grounded in love we may be able to comprehend with all the saints <coughs> excuse me, what is the breadth, the length, the height and the depth of that love and to know, to experience the love of Christ the intimate love of Christ that begins at salvation, and then we, we, just, we should be experiencing Christ's love every day. And that leads up to the third point of Paul's prayer, that you may be filled up. This is not just an academic exercise. This is not just a, a lesson. This is just not words on a piece of paper. This is for our life. This is for our life. This is for us to live that way, to think that way, to be that way. This you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. To all the fullness of God. There's a verse that gives a little bit of, uh, of help in understanding that over in chapter 4, verse 13, uh, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and that he's provided pastors uh, to equip us. And then look at... Uh, at the end of verse 12, building up of the body of Christ, and then chapter 4, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, there's that word knowledge again, of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now some people have taken this to the extreme. We're talking about the fullness of God, like that we're going to be little gods. No, we're not talking about that. We don't have that kind of supernatural power. We have supernatural power within us, the Holy Spirit. But we're talking about taking on the moral character of God, modeling who Christ is in our community, in our community of believers, in our community here at Farm Life, Williamston, Martin County, throughout the world, through our missionaries that we support, through our ministry efforts here, whether it's the Easter drama or whatever, uh, shoebox, uh, Christmas store, uh, whatever the ministries might be. These are ways of, of showing the fullness of God, the fullness of Christ, 
who are to mature in that way. Now, by the time I get here, I'm saying to myself, that really sounds good, Paul. And I don't mind praying that way. I'll pray that way, certainly for myself and some people that I think can think of. That's, that's great. But you know, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how that's going to work out. Maybe I don't have much faith. Maybe I don't see the reality of that. Maybe I don't believe the reality of that. Well, Paul in verse 20 just kind of snuffs that out. It's like he's saying, none of that. You're talking about being empowered by the God of the universe, His Holy Spirit that lives in you. You're talking about the love of Christ, that He went to the cross, that He lives in you, that He saved you from the bondage of sin. And now you're going to say, He's not going to answer that prayer? Now, verse 20, to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Let's use this word unfathomable again. It's immeasurable. There are no limits. We can't limit God. What God can do. What God will do. What God is doing for even one sinner to confess Christ and be born again, be a new creation, to be regenerated. It's a miracle of God's power and love. Just one. Just me. Just you. Just one. And it's according to the power that works within us. That power's already working in us. He's already said we prayed for it in verse 16. He talks about it over in verse 18 and 19 of chapter 1. That power's already working in us. And, and it's working, the idea there is, it's working in a convincing, drawing kind of way. Not to coerce us or force us, or twist our arm. That wouldn't be love. That wouldn't be grace. It's Christ wooing us, drawing us to Himself. The Gospel is a sweet aroma to those that are being saved. Verse 21, the ultimate. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Why does the church exist? To glorify God the Father, Christ the Son. To bring glory, to bring honor. Not notoriety to us as individuals, not notoriety to us as a church, but to God for His glory. For His glory for the riches of His glory meets our supply to all generations forever and ever. See, our responsibility is to be empowered to know the love of Christ, to be filled to all the fullness of God, to have a, a divine nature as 1 Peter chapter 1, I think verse 3 says that we, we're have a divine nature. We're indwelt by divine nature. All of that is for us to pass to the next generation. From generation to generation to generation. It doesn't stop with us. We honor and glorify Christ and God the Father by passing on the gospel to the next generation. Our children, our grandchildren. I'm sure that all of you in here Pray for your children every day. You pray for your grandchildren every day. Excuse me, that was a tough one. <laughs> you can't imagine who that was from. That was from Piney Grove Baptist Church. But that's, that's what this big purpose is. It's just 
multidimensional. We see words surpassing understanding, riches of His glory, His power, His love, which defies measuring. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. What a doxology. And then the final word, Amen. I wish you were here. We could have some discussion, get some feedback. Uh, we're going to be working on that maybe in a few weeks that we can, uh, we can do that. We'll keep praying to that end. So let's close in prayer. Father, indeed, these are just magnificent words that just soar beyond our understanding. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to begin to grasp and to be energized with your strength and to understand your great love for us in a deeper dimension than we've ever had before. And that we would mature in Christ, that we would model who you are, your moral attributes as we encounter people. And help us to just grasp that you can do this. You are doing this. That you can do far more than we could ever imagine. And I pray that you would do this for your honor and glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.